let's start this start a recording um for uh for people to look at afterwards so the project is a collaboration between the university of southampton's energy and climate change division and uh, us in cpre sussex and cpre hampshire with the support as i said for uh, from the center for the new south's new things fund which is a pot of money that enables uh, researchers at the university of southampton to collaborate with others for um, policy impact to turn the research into uh, kind of real world change and in terms of where we were coming from and our interest in um, in this area CPRE wants to see a rapid transition to zero carbon energy, um, but we also want to see that done in a way that protects nature uh, and landscapes and makes the best use of our limited land. Um, and we think that rooftop solar has a really key role to play. Uh, it's safe to say that CPRE sees climate change, climate breakdown as the biggest threat um, to the countryside that we uh, that we have. Uh, we've already seen those impacts in the countryside. Here in Sussex recently, we've had floods, uh, we've had crop loss. Um, previously, we've had uh, heat waves. And I mean, all our thoughts obviously are with people on the other side of the Atlantic today, the prospects of a three to four degrees uh, warming world are um, pretty unbearable to think about. So we do need to see a rapid transition to renewables. And we also need to see the countryside as a, as a working landscape and a place of constant change. CPRE doesn't take a kind of chocolate boxy view of the countryside, but there are things that we really value that we want to protect and make sure um, are preserved. Things like nature, things like the value of landscape, things like tranquility, food production, things we don't want to lose. So how do we integrate these concerns about the need to, um, uh, to have zero carbon energy quickly, um, but also protect the things we value about the countryside? So that's kind of where we're, um, where we're coming from. Uh, and that's why we were really delighted to collaborate with the University of Southampton, because their research expertise is gonna really help understand, as you're gonna hear later on, uh, how much rooftop solar can we actually do in our um, in our areas? Um, can our already developed land work harder and help us deliver uh, zero carbon energy uh, while protecting the things that we care about? So um, I'm going to say then a, a little bit about uh, about the policies that we think we um, we need if we're going to really accelerate rooftop solar across Hampshire and Sussex and indeed um, beyond. And later on, then you'll hear from um, from Luke and Ellis about the the new research and the new mapping, um, the real potential uh, from the bottom up, roof by roof. But what will it take to um, to get the most out of that potential? Who needs to do what? One of the things that we're um, launching today alongside the research and the mapping is our new policy brief, uh, getting solar off the ground, driving a rooftop revolution. Uh, that will be available shortly after, um, after this meeting and we'll make sure that um, we get a copy to all of you. Um, and it has recommendations for <coughs> central and local government uh, on uh, the policies that we need to um, to get that change happening. So I'm going to take you through just a whistle stop tour of what um, what that has to say. That uh, policy brief draws on a host of research from UCL, from um, uh, consultants WPI for CPRE, plus work from a whole host of other universities and indeed then a workshop that many of you will have been at um, with the University of Southampton earlier this year. A quick bit about the context. So in terms of solar, uh, the government has an ambitious target for solar, 70 gigawatts of, new, of capacity by 2035. That's somewhere between four and five times the amount that's currently out there. 
And I think it's safe to say that ground mounted solar is a critical part of the solution. I, I, under no illusions and CPRE is under no illusions about um, about the role of ground mounted solar. It is important um, and we're going to need uh, some of it. But from CPRE's point of view, uh, while we're not in principle opposed, it has to be done well when it's done. And so that means it's integrated well into the landscape. It's well screened, um, that there are community benefits and ideally community ownership. There are benefits for nature that we get multifunctional use of that land. Can we farm crops or animals at the same time or uh, provide for nature? Um, and we have to think about scale and cumulative impact as well when it comes to ground mounted solar. So it is an important part of the picture if we get it right. Um, but it's safe to say that uh, evidence from the House of Commons and elsewhere shows that done badly, ground mounted solar can lead to lots of community opposition, which in turn leads to project delays and even projects not happening. Um, and given that we need to get to zero carbon uh, energy quickly, uh, that's a problem. Uh, research from the University of Exeter for Friends of the Earth showed that we can actually massively increase um, solar with very limited land take and avoiding protected areas, areas for nature, protected landscapes and so on. Um, but we can do even better if we make the existing built environment and indeed new buildings still to come um, work harder for us. Why should that roof space just be sat there sort of doing nothing other than keeping us dry if it could also be um, providing us with power too? And uh, UCL's research for, uh, for CPRE, our colleagues in, in the national office, um, uh, found that there is enough roof space to meet more than the UK target um, and that new buildings and new car parks and indeed existing car parks and large warehouses are obvious kind of locations to really focus that energy um, and effort. Uh, So, given that that potential is there, uh, what are our recommendations for central government to, um, to make the most of it? Firstly, we've got that national target, 70 gigawatts of solar capacity by 2035. We think that government should be a bit clearer about where that, that solar is going to go. How should that balance be split? And we're, uh, we're recommending that uh, a minimum of 60% of that capacity is on rooftops, on car parks, on existing grey space, effectively. Um, uh, and the obvious place to start is with new build. So one of our other recommendations is that all new builds and all new car parks um, include solar as a matter of course. It seems absolutely crazy in uh, in. 2024, 25 and onwards, uh, if we're in a position where we're building new buildings and we're not at the time that they're being put up, including solar in the construction. And that goes for uh, solar shading over car parks, which are going to be increasingly filled with EVs in any case in need of a charge. Um, so that's the obvious place to start. And actually UCL in their uh, research found that new builds between now and 2050, uh, there's the potential for nearly 20 gigawatts of solar capacity just on, on new builds. But new builds alone is, um, is, not, um, is not enough. Um, we're going to need to think about how do we, um, how do we in integrate um, uh, retrofitting and solar onto existing buildings. And um, it's this a matter of significant disappointment to me that in all the uh, government uh, talk about consultations about planning reforms that we've heard so far, we've heard very little about the future home standard and whether uh, whether new solar will be mandatory going forward. Let's hope so. Let's cross our fingers on that. But um, it's not just about uh, uh, not just about the, the sort of building standards and about retrofit and about putting solar mandatorily on new builds. Um, it is about making sure that 
we uh, we change our approach to thinking about um, planning for energy. At the moment, there's still a bit of a sense that lots of development is uh, thought about in kind of one framework uh, through through planning. But energy planning sort of happens in multiple different places, partly through the planning framework, partly in other silos and all other forms of uh, kind of land use planning happen in, in other places, in completely other places. We would like to see um, revisions to planning policy, so revisions to the NPPF, that also integrate um, a, a wider land use framework. So we can look at in the round, how should we be using and planning for the use of land that thinks about renewables, yes, but also integrates that with the needs for nature, food production, flood management, and other, other things. Um, and that also entails working on a, um, a more strategic uh, basis for thinking about planning for renewables. So thinking about, um, uh, about it, not just local planning authority by local planning authority, but thinking about it on a more regional and national basis um, to make sure that we get the right things in the right places, we don't duplicate, um, that we make best use of the land we have. We've also said in this policy brief, and this will be um, of no surprise to anyone, that we do think there needs to be um, financial support to make sure that when we're talking about retrofits as opposed to new builds, uh, that there is there are financial um, products and financial systems that support uh, support that to happen. So, as an example, um, we think that the current uh, smart export guarantee uh, should be paid at a higher rate to provide a greater incentive for um, private householders to uh, to put pipe panels on their homes. Um, but we also think that there needs to be specific funding for social housing providers to, um, to get those retrofits happening uh, for them. We know that uh, social housing providers are in a tough place at the moment, uh, all the demands uh, uh, around um, around making sure that uh, cladding is dealt with, that um, that the the finances stack up um, uh, just on existing social housing. Never mind with putting um, uh, new solar panels on and so on. So we think there needs to be specific uh, funding for for that. We've also said that it's pretty critical that uh, we put community planned and owned solar at the heart of thinking about um, the sort of solar side of things. Uh, we sort of hear periodically things from government about the value of community benefit when it comes to new infrastructure. And communities definitely should be benefiting from, um, uh, from <coughs> new renewables. But we think the kind of gold standard is where that's done, where the planning is done in collaboration with communities. And actually communities don't just kind of benefit in some small way, but they actually get benefits from owning some or parts of the solar infrastructure and the benefits that come from, from that financially themselves. So we think that there's a special role for, um, uh, for community ownership that should be foregrounded in the government's approach. And finally, um, in terms of our recommendations for central government, we've um, we've said that there is a critical um, role in terms of unblocking uh, constraints on local distribution networks. So we um, there's a lot of conversation around um, the transmission grid and constraints on the transmission side of things um, and the need for grid reinforcement there. But actually, when it comes to unlocking the potential for rooftop. Um, and indeed, for unlocking smart grids um, and the opportunities for us to use new EVs and their batteries to uh, to grid balance and so on, um, that there's a really critical role in unlocking um, constraints on local distribution networks. So we've um, we've also had some things to say uh, about what local government might do to help us. Uh, get that rooftop revolution that we're after. One of the things that local authorities do so well um, 
is uh, is convene other other players, bring people together, and one of the things that's so exciting about um, the rooftop mapping that we're going to show you in a, in a minute, but in fact also other tools like um, uh, the Centre for Sustainable Energy Solar Wizard, is that you can get right down into uh, individual streets, individual neighbourhoods, and really identify ooh, where, are the, where are the sort of juicy hotspots that have got lots of rooftop potential, uh, and perhaps focus incentives um, in those places, focus um, attention, bring people together, building owners, installers, finance people, to um, really have a kind of targeted go at doing particular streets or particular neighbourhoods. Um, we've clearly seen uh, some you know, excellent initiatives like uh, Solar Together and the, um, uh, the, uh, the idea of um, uh, getting uh, bulk buying effectively uh, rooftop solar for people across um, uh, whole areas. But a, a neighbourhood by neighbourhood targeted approach could really see um, some some real benefit in making this um, uh, making these things run quickly, um, not least because you brought everyone together and people can see whether that's building owners um, or residents can see, oh, well, my neighbours are doing it. Maybe I'll get involved, too. The next thing, and I'm sure many people are thinking about this at the moment, local area energy plans um, as people are developing local area energy plans the critical thing is to make sure that when it comes to the solar component of that that we're looking at how we maximize rooftop that we're sort of just building in that that thinking um, from the word go rather than sort of seeing that as a um, as a kind of you know down down the end of the uh, of the pipe um, kind of issue uh, what the the research shows is that there is significant uh significant capacity in um in hampshire and sussex and indeed uh, across the whole country and so we should be thinking about how we really make the most of that as a central feature of um local area energy planning and that goes similarly for kind of local plans as well um in policies in local plans we'd really love to see tougher energy efficiency standards, mandatory rooftop solar for new builds, uh, and potentially where it's much bigger um, refurbishments and some consideration about in strongly encouraging at the very least people to install um, rooftop solar at that point. But also a highly strategic approach to, um, to ground mounted schemes. Um, so that means making sure that we're not just thinking uh, local authority by local authority, but we are collaborating kind of on a regional scale about where's the best place for ground mounted schemes to go, that we're thinking about cumulative impact, we're thinking about conditionality around um, gains for nature, um, trying to make sure that that land use is multifunctional, and critically thinking about requirements for end of life too. Um, I know that there's significant concerns in many communities about, well, you know, you've granted a 25 or even 40 year permission for a ground mounted scheme. What happens at the end? Is there, are there strong enough conditions to make sure that uh, the uh, owners who've benefited from that um, will, uh, will kind of put the land back um, as needed um, and restore, restore uh, things to how they were if the, the uh, permission ends and that particular land use finishes. Um, and finally, and again, I don't think this will be a great surprise, and many local authorities have obviously been making great strides on this over many, many years, but there is still plenty potential for deploying rooftop solar on uh, local authorities' own uh, building stock, and indeed collaborating with other uh, public sector outfits, uh, local health partners, uh, schools, universities, and so on, to... Um, to drive uh, drive uptake and drive those uh, local um, uh, um, businesses that are um, delivering uh, rooftop solar, those installers and so on, by using procurement to um, to put the money where your mouth is. So that's a kind of real whistle stop tour of um, 
of what uh, what we've said in our policy brief. As I say, we'll be circulating that. It will be up online um, later on. Um, but that's just a, a canter through some of the headlines about um, what we're recommending for central government and local government um, to do to really, really make the most of um, the potential that we have. And in a second, um, I'm happy to take any quick questions on that. But in a second, then we'll hear the bit you're really kind of here for, the exciting stuff, which is the brand new research from the University of Southampton. Uh, and uh, they'll be telling you, yeah, what they've what they've found. So that's it from me. Um, happy to take any questions, Alison. I think you might have been keeping an eye on the chat and any questions that have been popping yeah. up there. Hi, Paul. Yeah, there's a couple of um, more comments and questions, really. Um, John T, I think that's John Taylor, is from the community energy sector, and he's saying that there's a real big role for the community energy sector to help deliver those recommendations. I don't know whether, John, whether you want to comment more on that. Not sure where, where, whether... Anyway, John, you can come back on that one. And then Steve is talking about solar together and how useful that has been. So, um, Steve, did you want to say anything more about solar together? Hi, yes. Um, thanks. Uh, I uh, signed up to the scheme back in 22 and had uh, 20 panels put on my roof. Um, the cost to me uh, with the batteries, etc., is around £12,000, which seems an awful lot of money. Uh, but I considered it a good investment. And I can certainly tell you that in the two years I've had it, uh, with the money that I've had back from the uh, selling the uh, surplus energy back to the grid, et cetera, uh, I've probably um, saved myself between three and three and a half thousand pounds in those two years. So um, I'll soon be getting my, my money back for my investment, if you like. Um, so I, I can't um, speak highly enough of the of the scheme and how it has worked for me. I know I'm lucky that my my building is is south facing or um, slightly southwest, um, and I've got a you know a large enough roof area for that many panels. But uh, I think um, I'm not unusual in uh, where I live, um, and I think that um, there's a lot of people that could benefit from that as well. Um, and I think what we really could do with this is some sort of um, scheme a public loan board or whatever to assist uh, that and that would be a good thing that came from the government if there was some sort of uh, uh, scheme whereby people could get low interest loans from the government through the councils uh, to have these uh, this equipment put onto their roofs it would save their money in the long run and I think they'd soon be uh, should be able to pay that money back yeah and we've got another one from Liz on um, will we see a relaxation in South Downs National Park um, planning of planning restrictions on rooftop solar? Um, yeah, do you want me to say something? Um, it, it's, it's just that in Furl, um, all pretty well all our village is in the South Downs National Park. And what puts off I mean, we are a tenanted community. Um, there are some um, private householders, but I think what puts off the um, private householders as well as the um, estate management is the restrictions on planning permission from the South Downs National Park. You know, we have quite a lot of roofs that face the, um, the South Downs. And, um, you know, some are would be very obvious from the South Downs, but many of the house rooftops would not be. And I'm just wondering whether there's any pressure from CPRE or in the future planning regulations to relax some of these restrictions in in uh, rooftop solar in national parks. Thank you. Um, so obviously you'll know as, as well as I that the um, the South Downs National Park is just embarking on a review of its uh, local plan. And that is certainly something we'll be wanting to discuss with uh, with the South Downs National Park Authority um, in as part of that review. I think the kind of significant consultations will kick off early in the new year and making representations on that, I think, would be to uh, to the authority would be really, really welcome. OK, thank you. 
there's just the final question is just about the slides being available. So, David, we will be circulating, I think, the policy brief, um, probably a link to the map for that um, Ellis and um, Luke are going to talk about. Um, and I'll ask if we can get the slides as well. So we will be sending things out after um, after this meeting. I think that's all, Paul. Great. So I think it's probably time to welcome Dr. Luke Blunden and uh, Ellis Redette from uh, from the University of Southampton. Hello. Can you hear us all right? Good afternoon. Um, yeah, it's great to be in this webinar. Uh, thanks for attending. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Luke Blunden. This is Ellis Redette. We're both researchers in um, the Energy and Climate Change Division at the University of Southampton. And um, can you see our presentation? It should be appearing sometimes, I see. Can everybody see that in full screen mode? Yeah. Thumbs up? Yeah, great. Okay, thanks one. So um, the Energy and Climate Change Division has been involved in photovoltaic related research for over 25 years now. Um, including early projects on solar reef tiles, uh, solar refrigeration of vehicles. Uh, there's a small picture there of an iceberg, which is being cooled by uh, a solar panel, which is part of an art installation. Um, PV in social housing, more fundamental work on um, characterizing different kinds of solar cells um, and applications of photovoltaics, including um, the impact of cleaning uh, PV and dusty environments, and also energy for development. So on the bottom right there is a solar mini grid in Kenya, um, which is, is providing power to communities far from the grid. Okay, next one, yeah. So, so our involvement in this project um, um, so we have, has the following uh, aims. Um, so it's really about providing community groups with some impartial information that they can then use to make decisions about uh, what they think should happen in their own local area. Um, and in, in order to do that, um, being able to compare the potential for rooftop based PV generation versus uh, the ground mount, which is planned and existing within that local area. Um, I think we've managed to achieve these aims, um, but you can judge that based on uh, what we'll show you over the next few slides. Uh, next one, you good? Okay, so there are basically two approaches you can take uh, when it comes to assessing the amount of power you can generate from rooftops. Um, a sort of quick and dirty method is, is to do a top-down method, um, which, which is good on a very large scale. Uh, essentially, you just take the number of buildings, um, you might classify them into different, a few different types, and then you assign some value of um, typical potential generation for, for each type, and then you just simply do a sum and add it up. Um, the other thing about this is it doesn't really take account of um, variation that might occur at a local level. We'll see from the map later on that, depending on the character of, of a town or a, um, a village or a settlement, the types of rooftops you get and um, even things like the amount of shading orientation does vary from place to place. Um, so this inherently has some error, which you can't really uh, quantify or, or understand. So a more uh, detailed approach, but much more um, kind of expensive in terms of effort required is to actually take available data on those rooftops and then analyze for each one um, how much solar radiation, how much sunlight is falling on that roof uh, every year. Um, so those, those are the two methods. So we'll just go to the next slide. Um, so, so our work isn't, isn't the first or only project to do this. Um, there's some excellent tools out there. Um, for example, in the USA, Google have got involved in, in using their enormous data sets to um, 
um, give an estimate of solar potential, but that's that's US only at the moment. Um, and there are other, other websites. In the UK, uh, the Centre for Sustainable Energy, based in Bristol, um, they've produced a tool which covers the UK. It's, it's focused on sort of local authorities and it's, it's all about giving homeowners an idea of what they could put on their own roof. So their emphasis is a little bit different from ours. We're more interested in kind of communities as a whole and the potential for, you know, larger areas. Uh, okay, next one. Um, so there's a, a previous case study we did in Southampton, um, which is kind of why we got involved in this project, uh, where we looked at individual buildings um, using a particular kind of data, uh, which is uh, not in this slide, but we'll, we'll talk about it in a couple of slides time. Um, but um, so this was a rooftop by rooftop study. And um, we looked at what what generation that could be on every different reef in Southampton. Um, however, since that time, the actual availability of data on buildings and on you know the three dimensional shape of the buildings has actually got much better, um, as has the computational power that we have available. So, even though this study uh, took a long time and a lot of effort. We've now been able to scale up and not just look at one city, but look at a much larger area. Okay. Um, just to mention, there are some other studies which you may want to, to look at. Um, there was a previous study for CPRE, which UCL did, looking at a top-down approach uh, based on generic classes of buildings um, across the country. Uh, there, there have even been global studies looking at um, the potential across the whole world, which um, is really impressive, um, but necessarily very high level, very simplified. Um, at the more detailed level, there was a study done for, um, I think it's Mid-Sussex District Council. And um, again, there's a sort of a top-down approach. They take the number of buildings in different categories and then multiply them by reasonable numbers to give, to give um, sort of a quick estimate. So these are some previous studies. Um, so now I'm going to move on to how we did it in this particular study. And I'm going to pass over to Alice, who did most of the analysis. And yeah, go for it. Cheers, Luke. Um, yeah, so obviously, as Luke said, we've done it from a kind of bottom up approach. So we're looking at building by building. And to do that, the main kind of, or the largest data that we use, which um, uh, you'll see how we use it a bit later is LIDAR data, um, which is which looks at meter by meter um, for the whole of Hampshire and the whole of Sussex. And so there's a data point for every meter squared. So you can imagine the size of the data that we were kind of getting, um, which is why, as Lou said, it's quite, uh, it takes quite a lot of time, quite a lot of effort. Um, we use that with the, with the building uh, footprint and put this through our solar resource tool, which, well, yeah, I'll go through a bit by bit um, and then we get our output which is yeah with what's the suitability of each building and the potential pv capacity um, of each rooftop so there's a few things that we kind of want to say before we go into this that aren't particularly considered um, so the status of the buildings so whether it's listed or not is not considered in here for example um, the roof type um, or the structural suitability is not assessed either, um, simply because there's not particular data for that. Um, network constraints, so uh, Paul touched on this a bit earlier, that, yeah, there's distribution network um, uh, capacity issues uh, across, well, the UK, really. Um, and so what can actually be installed, especially on a larger scale, um, is, is massively constrained, and this hasn't been uh, considered here. Um, there's some gaps in the LIDAR data, so it's not perfect. Um, so for these ones, actually, there might be an area where you might, might think, oh, actually, I could get some, I'm in a prime spot for some rooftop solar. But if the data is not available to us, then, yeah, we haven't been able to process it. 
and the building polygons used are for rooftops only instead of individual buildings so for example a row of terrace houses may come across as a single rooftop and um, just spread across so it might just be like an elongated um, rectangle instead of being split up into individual buildings um, but yeah as we're looking mainly from like a uh, local area um, and a policy kind of point of view um, this isn't particularly an issue um, but if you're looking building by building and you want to see how much you can get in your house it might might become an issue um, so yeah and also so obviously the, the data just considers a rooftop essentially and um, historic buildings like showing here is this the pavilion Brighton pavilion yeah um, they've not been excluded so just because it's showing up we can put a load of solar pv on here it doesn't particularly mean that you'll be able to um so just a few things to consider really here when when you're looking at and using the map um so the lidar data so as i say yeah every meter square for the whole of hampshire and sussex is given an elevation um from how yeah high up it is off the ground really and so this includes the ground itself this includes things like trees buildings and um, anything really that's just a normal structure um, and then you can kind of when well, well when plotting you can kind of see actually the individual um, the individual kind of characteristics here so comparing these two images here yeah you can see the trees on the left hand side you can see a high-rise building but it also allows you then to look at slopes of buildings and the aspects of buildings which is really quite crucial when considering rooftop suitability um, so we ran this lead our data for quite a really clever tool, um, which determines this, the amount of sunshine that each meter squared gets. So what this does, this tracks the sun position um, for, for a whole year. Um, so we did it hourly for 2023. Um, and this then essentially looks at everything for each meter squared, it looks at everything around it for each of them hours. So for example, if we'd look at that little graph on the, uh, or the little diagram on the left there. So if we're considering this, this roof, this house in the middle, early in the morning when the sun's rising or when it's going, you can see that we're gonna be shaded from the big high rise building on the left. And then when the sun's up high, we, we're gonna be getting some sunshine. And then later on, um, when the sun's setting more, there might be a bit of shading from this tree here as well. And so this tool considers that and runs it for every meter square, um, which is why it's, very computational heavy so because for every meter squared in the whole of hampshire and sussex we're running 8760 computations um which is yeah massive um and this is just yeah a bit to prove that the shading that is generated really so and then you end up with something that looks a bit like this on the right here um so this is an example in southampton you can see the football stadium um so this is the lead our data on the left and on the right, the solar radiation output. So you can see a good example is if you're looking at the stadium, actually, um, you can see that the, the taller bits, the actual stadium itself, the roof of the stadium is getting quite sufficient amount of sun. Whereas some of the lower bits that will be shaded by the stadium itself is getting quite a lower amount of solar radiation um, per year. So obviously are potentially not suitable uh, so then we're going to crop it to that simplified buildings layer. So this is taken from the Ordnance Survey um, buildings data, because obviously we're only interested in rooftops. We don't care really about the trees, the roads and anything like that. And then we apply some conditions then really to um, filter this down to our suitable areas. And some of these are, so I said, yeah, we ran it for every hour for 2023. We took a buffer of 0.5 meters, so inside the building edge boundary, um, so that we're not overhanging over the edge of the roofs. We took um, anything with a solar radiation of less than 800 kilowatt hours per meter squared was excluded, because these are areas that aren't getting a particular amount of sunshine due to shading or you know, the location of it. We took areas, uh, we excluded areas that were less than three meters squared, so three meters squared we took to be about half a kilowatt. And so we started at half a kilowatt and then we move up, um, go up in increments of half a kilowatt from there. So we took and used the leader data then to calculate an average slope, aspect and solar radiation. 
and then use the suitable area from, from these conditions and to calculate the potential installed capacity. Um, and then, as I said, yeah, they, these were going up in 0 0.5 increments. So, and rounded down. So obviously if, if our model is saying that we can get 2.7 kilowatt peaks, this is rounded down to 2.5 um, because yeah, that's how you essentially buy panels. So this is what the model, <laughs> the black box of the model looks like. Absolutely terrifying. It took a long time to develop. Um, so these are just an example of the inputs of the data. Um, so the yeah the input of the data here, which is the green bits, and then the yellow bits here are the tools, and the following green bits are the outputs of the tools. So run through, input the data. We're running through our area solar radiation tool, our slope on our aspect, and we're then converting it into formats that. Are useful to us polygons rather than raster data sets because they're a lot smaller and easier to manage. Um, again, so the, and then the rest of this is normally just a bit of formatting, um, aggregating it to each building, and um, yeah, and then some some more formatting and adding on the data bits to, at, the, at the end. And then at the end, we get our suitable um, <clears throat> our suitable rooftops. And polygon, which we then put into our map. So it's probably best not to all oh, jump on this straight away. Um, big, big whilst, test. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. While we're um, while we're showing you, um, the link will be at the end as well. Yeah, but um, yeah, the link will be available to you all to have a play around with it at the end. So, did you want to go for the first bit of the map? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> so. The map uh, combines a number of different uh, data sets. Um, uh, one of them is the existing and planned ground mounted uh, photovoltaic arrays in Hampshire and Sussex. And this data has been collated by volunteers uh, from CPRE from a variety of sources, including the embedded capacity register, but also from planning portals and, and other things. Um, and on the right hand side, Hopefully you can see there's a, a legend um, which shows, so you've got a number of kind of circles on the map um, and the color um, relates to the current status of, of that particular ground mount array. Can you move um, the map over, Luke? We can't, I think, you just oh, need that's to... a screenshot at the moment, sorry. A oh, screenshot. okay, that's great. Um, we can pull up the actual map in, in a minute. Uh, I was just, we're just going to do it this way, just in case the um, the laptop decides to crash. Um, <laughs> hopefully, it won't. But we we we'll, we will try that. Um, yeah. So the size the size of the uh, circle relates to the the capacity, uh, either existing or planned. Um, and you can click on uh, the circles to see more details, including the capacity, the size, the address, and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so that's just one of the layers. Um, so another layer um, is actual kind of polygons which go around existing arrays. So this is purely for existing um, constructed ground mounted PV. Just because um, with the circles, the, the addresses are quite, the locations are quite approximate um, because usually, you know, the solar arrays are not in a place where you have a particular um, accurate address necessarily. Uh, so the polygons can help you um, identify where the exact locations of the um, solar arrays are. So that's another layer. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, so the most most detailed of the layers is this rooftop by rooftop um, solar PV potential. And you can see there's a legend on the right, which is in kilowatt peak. So you can see that the color scale varies um, from a sort of zero kilowatt peak up to very large numbers, um, which relate to, um, like in the case of Sussex, for example, the biggest area the model picked out was at Gatwick Airport, which makes sense. Um, but yeah, so there's a color scale and you can click on individual rooftops and you can see what the potential capacity of that rooftop is. 
Um, so that's the building or rooftop by rooftop data, but also, um, which, um, you know, possibly more useful from this point of view is this project. You can actually click on districts um, and you can, so this is for Hampshire and Sussex, we're just showing Hampshire at the moment. And you can see the aggregated potential rooftop capacity uh, broken down by either domestic or non-domestic in those areas. And you can see that the proportion of domestic versus non-domestic actually varies according to the sort of character of the area. So the new forest is obviously less industry and so on. So you get um, less non-domestic, whereas in more urban areas, you get a higher proportion of non-domestic um, warehouses and so on. And yeah, so you can click on any of the districts and you can see what the potential is for rooftop PV in those, those categories of building. Um, okay, and yeah, so just in summary, these figures are in the, will be in the report, but um, so Hampshire and Sussex, quite similar potential capacity. Um, so that should be megawatt peak rather than megawatts, but right. <laughs> that's fine. Um, of around two gigawatts for each of the counties, which is, you know, obviously very significant. Um, with with domestic rooftops taking up the sort of the biggest share of that. Um, but obviously we're not making any economic analysis here and um, a lot of those domestic installations would be, you know, quite small values. Mm -hmm. So this doesn't re this doesn't reflect necessarily the um, optimum in terms of the economic sort of rollout or installation of rooftop PV. It's just a kind of upper bound figure. Um, okay, so before we actually show you the live map, uh, just to acknowledge the. As uh, Paul said, the funding from the Centre for the South, uh, also supported by the Energy and Climate Change Division, which we work for. Um, the, uh, the voluntary work provided by CPRE in terms of the solar farm locations. And of course, the open data from Ordnance Survey um, and the LIDAR data, mainly from the Environment Agency, which provided by Digimap. And um, yeah, just to go back to that link again, if you want to try it. So this will be a good test of the... Uh, Should we show it first? Or... Yes. I can put this back on at the if end. You switch over to the live map. Oh, Moment of truth. Can... can you all see this all right? So this is as if you just clicked on that link now, you'd get this kind of disclaimer and a bit of that explains what's going on really what what's been done so i guess this this was kind of covered in the slides all of this and um, you went through and this is what would greet you yeah um, that's brilliant yeah so that uh, sort of initial uh, screen that you saw there if you need to get that again you can click on the i on the right hand side um, and that so you can always get that information if you need to you need to do that. So this this interface, um, it, it's kind of I'm not sure if you've used something like this before. Often local councils use it for their kind of um, geographical data. Um, a bit similar to Google Maps or something like that. Essentially, you've got a base layer, which in this case is the kind of um, aerial photography. And then on top of that, you've got different layers laid on top of each other, and you can uh, switch them on and off. And that's the, if you look in the top right part, top right button there, this actually gives you a list of layers. And you can see some of them are uh, invisible at the moment, and some of them are visible, and you can switch them on and off as, as you like, so you can focus on the data that you're really interested in. Um, so if you look at the screen at the moment, we've got, um, we've got the district um, PV potential summaries showing. We've also got the outlines of the national parks, um, which we can switch on or off like that. And also we've got the 
existing data about the ground mounted PV. So should we zoom in on one? So you can zoom in by scrolling. Um, if you can pick one of those um, circles. Yeah, that's a good one. Oh, screen, see that too much. Can do this on the left, but <laughs> you should have yeah. yeah, we'll click on that one. So we've clicked on one of the existing um, ground mount arrays, and you can see some, some data about it there. So there's an existing array, and there's a, a one in with an application in progress here. Um, not all of the data is available for all of the uh, sites. Um, and the data is actually in a form where it can be updated in the future. Uh, so this is kind of a live layer that can be updated with, with more information. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's good. Okay, so should we try the detailed data? This is yeah. Well, should we just switch off? Oh yeah, yeah. Try that. yeah. You can click on like. Uh... So if we click off. Click on one of the districts, um, and you can see here you've got the name of the district. You've got the num total number of rooftops that were analysed in that district, and then you've got the potential for domestic and non-domestic rooftop PV there. So, so much like turn these switch off. off, yeah. Turn these off, yeah. Ooh. Okay, this this is the one that will probably uh, cause the laptop to crash if anything does. So this is the um, this is the rooftop by rooftop data. Um, there's around a million rooftops that have been analysed. Um, and given what we mentioned about the polygons being simplified, uh, the actual number of properties covered would be much, much higher than that. But, um, as you zoom in, it looks a bit kind of blocky, but it, the resolution will improve, hopefully in the next few seconds. So we can zoom right in. Mm -hmm. Let's find a better area. Let's go down there. Yeah. yeah. Just zooming in on a particular randomly chosen area. And as you zoom in, you see more detail. And so, yeah, you can click on any of the building rooftop polygons, and it will give you the potential capacity in kilowatt, kilowatt peak. Mm -hmm. um, bearing in mind all the kind of caveats and assumptions that we've we highlighted earlier, um, there are areas with where there are some gaps in the lidar data. Um, we will very shortly be uploading um, the well, basically some polygons that show the missing areas. So there, there may be the odd place where you think, oh, there should be a good total resource here, but actually there's nothing. Uh, and that's probably because there's a gap in the data. Um, yeah, so do you want to show the legend? It's the second. So the second uh, button down is, is a legend. And it so for whatever layers you've got um, in focus at that point, it will show you um, a color scale or, or a classification for that particular particular area. Yep. Show them the search facility as well. It's very good. So it's got a very good um, search facility. You can just oh, type okay. in address or part of an address or a postcode and it will yeah, that's a good one. Uh, mm -hmm. And it will usually find the place you're looking for. So here we've got Gatwick. Um, see there are a number of quite large <laughs> um, Building rooftops that have been picked out. Yeah. Um, 
but this is this is a yeah an example of how we're just using the data to spit out results. We're not really um, validating each of the buildings in turn, given that there you know there's a million of them. Okay, um, so those are the sort of main uh, aspects of the the map. Um, I guess it might be a good time to take any questions at this point. Is that okay, Alison? Yeah, that's fine. So there's a few questions that have come through in this second session. Um, and people might want to comment a little bit more. Martin started off by um, giving a good a good breakdown of um, the large scale roofs and warehousing. And he was questioning, are we really going to need rooftop solar if if the priority should be for large scale, um, you know, roofs on warehouses? I don't know whether anybody wants to pick that up. I'm, I'm thinking from your figures, Luke and Ellis, there does seem to be a, a need for domestic rooftop solar as well. I don't know, Martin, are you on the call? Do you want to ask your question? Any, any any comments then, Luke or Ellis, just given the breakdown you've done from domestic and non-domestic? Um, yeah, like as I mentioned, we haven't done any economic kind of um, analysis of each rooftop because um, that would be adding in a further sort of set of assumptions. Um, but but clearly, the bigger the rooftop, you know, the the lower the overhead cost is. So it, it, in terms of you know, kind of um, changing cost versus changing capacity, you definitely would go for the, the big rooftops first. Um, but if, you, if you're if aiming for a really high penetration of, of rooftop PV, then then yeah, the domestic has to be part of, part of that. Um, Can I just chip in, Alison, and, and just to add that in terms of the, um, the where that uh, recommended target that I was talking about earlier about 60% of the of the total um, PV being kind of rooftops and car parks and so on um, a lot of the thinking was around that kind of came from the the UCL research that uh, that Luke referred to and that did take into account some sense of what is costly and what is what is cheaper and clearly installing stuff uh, on new build at the time you build it is particularly cost effective and then doing larger roofs, warehouses, and so on, and existing um, is uh, is particularly um, cost effective as well. And so the idea that uh, that sort of doing sixty percent of the total UK target on um, rooftops and car parks uh, takes takes into account that sense of like what is what is the most cost effective. Um, in principle, there is in, enough uh, enough rooftop capacity to meet. The entirety of the target, but um, but from a cost ef efficiency point of view, and given the speed with which we need to get down to uh, to kind of zero carbon, um, that's why we've um, we've recommended that sixty percent. Thank you. And if, I, if I click on that as well, from a network point of view as well, I mean, if if you cluster, you know, if you've got a resident or an industrial estate or something, every building on that is filled to the brim with. Um, so there's a lot of power that will be flown back through the network to then be distributed elsewhere. So from a network point of view, perhaps um, distributing kind of solar you know, evenly across the network is of really quite great benefit, really, without it having to go through substations, go through cables to distribute the power to where it needs to go. Um, yeah, that's just, yeah, it will be beneficial to the network, definitely. Yeah, I think, I a, um, I said it's Martin here. I finally managed to uh, get my microphone working. Hi, Martin. Hi, thanks for that. Yeah, I mean, that, I think my point yeah, is, is is very much along those in economic terms. Um, putting say four kilowatts on the roof of a house is is absolutely great. Indeed, I've got quite a lot of that on my own roof. But uh, you know, the cost there may be anywhere between say one pound twenty and two pounds a, uh, a watt to get the this the system up and running. On a large scale commercial warehouse, that cost may be anywhere between, say, 60p and 70p a watt. 
And if you're talking about a, a particularly good um, ground mount system, that costs maybe as low as 50p a watt. So you can see that the differences in, in costs across the piece. And you know, we're talking about a factor of four potentially from a large scale ground mount to putting stuff on rooftops. So that's, I think that's always something we've got to bear in mind. We, you know, we just can't, well, I don't know, can we afford it? But if we, one of our policy aims is to produce cheap electricity and to deal with fuel poverty, then we've got to look at the more the, the more cost effective ways of generating solar PV, which will lead us to things like large scale commercial rooftops and, and ground mounts. Now there's still quite a huge role for, for domestic rooftops as well, huge role. But uh, you know, if in terms of the grand scheme of things, commercial big scale commercial uh, rooftops and ground mounts are gonna have to play quite a significant role as well. No, thank you, Martin. That's a, a point well made. I think Carol makes a point in the chat, though, about third party um, warehouses. Warehouses are often owned by third party developers. So um, and in that need for doing things quickly, there's some quite complicated things to overcome there. So um, it, the economic cases definitely have to be considered. Just going through the chat um, in battle, David is saying, They've got, they're wanting to make a solar town. I don't know if you can bring battle up on the map. Ellis, quickly, I don't know if there's a postcode you can pop into the, um, to see, but that's that sounds a brilliant, um, you know, sort of strategic battle. objective for battle. Battle, yeah, battle. Where's that? Battle. Where's, where's battle, David? We need a, we, we, oh, we need a, very nice a postcode, to, uh, don't we? It's <laughs> not very nice to hear. Uh, battle, it's north of uh, Hastings, um, and the start of the postcode would be Tango November 3 3. Is this it? Really? Yes, yes, that's it. Brilliant. So, have we got much potential there for? Uh, but this is what this map's all about, David, is to see, you know, you can see at a glance now um, where the opportunities are in battle. Um, yeah, you know, and, and, you know, you, you will know because of your knowledge of battle whether, whether these make sense, but they're certainly a good starting point for your group to have a look at and to that's really a good example of how we might want the, the map to be used. Lovely. Thank you very much. Just say so we're going to be adding uh, additional layers for parish level. Um, we just haven't done that yet, but at the moment it's just just at the district level, but um, we'll be having parish shape goals as well. And, nice um, to you in battle. Thank yeah, you. David, please come back and tell us how that goes. That would be I will do. indeed. Yeah. Thank you. Fun. Um, Julia is, is asking about the use of um, SAR data, SAR data. Um, Lewis, Ellis, do you know anything about that? Can that replace the gaps in LIDAR data? I don't know whether I'm saying any of those things correctly. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I haven't looked at that, as a synthetic aperture radar. Um, yeah, I could, I haven't looked at the sort of coverage and so on, but it, that's yeah, thank you. That's a good point. Should look at that. I was yeah. feeling that maybe at a lower resolution. Yeah, it's the it's the lower resolution, resolution but, yeah. But okay. the missing areas, because the majority of the areas obviously were covered. So it's a relatively smallish area that wasn't covered by the data. Um so to fill in it might not be a bad idea. Something to consider. Thank you. That sounds very helpful. Um so Martin's asking him with the data tool be available to the public. So the answer is yes. Um, yeah. So it's going to, correct me if I'm wrong here, Luke, but it's going to be on the CPRE websites, isn't it? Um, is it going to be anywhere else that people can access it? I mean, this oh. this web link will work directly, um, okay. but it will be embedded um, yeah, in CPRE. And I think we'll, we'll put it on our website as well. So I, yeah, can I just comment on that? Um, Obviously, the question was answered because suddenly the QR link appeared and I used it on my phone and it all worked. I did what everyone would do. I looked at my own house to see whether it was on there. Um, and the data, uh, assuming I used the tool properly, the data was missing for my my my, my street. Um, but it made me think of another question because I've got solar panels on my roof. Does the model... Take into account where solar panels are already installed and therefore, you know, take that off the model. No, it doesn't. That's a very good point. Um, it'd be, we'd have to use some sort of 
image recognition or something like that um, to do that, I think, which would be, I mean, it's totally possible. This is these learning, these days, with, with machine learning tools, things like that can can be done. But that would be, yeah, another uh, another bit of work. Um, That's another project to in do. itself, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've no idea what percentage of that difference will make to your overall figures, but it will make some difference, won't it? Because yeah. the, the installs are already out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank I guess you. From our point of view, we're just sort of looking at the the overall potential, which could include existing as well as, um, um, yeah, not yet existing. Yeah. Hey. Okay. Right, thank you. Thank you, Martin. And a bit, a bit similar from Carol saying, now the map's been has been created, will it be maintained, and for how long? Um, um I certainly know that the the um, data for the existing ground mounting solar is a is just a point in time and it, and we can update that bit can't we Luke by adding um, new sites in and um, that's possible to update but I don't know about the rest of it um, yeah it can it can be um, running it's possible now you've, we've got the model set up so yep. in theory for example, in five years or something, if new lidar data data sets are available, then they could be crunched back through through the model. Um, there, there's no particular time limit on the moment. Um, this will um, it's using a kind of industry standard uh, tool, so there's no guarantees, but there's no particular reason why it will it shouldn't be up for you know the order of years. Yeah. I mean, it's just shape file data, isn't it? So even if the map gets system gets updated, it mm. will still run yeah. fine. On that, so. yeah. Brilliant. Um, and a question about um, parish level. Does the map give an indication of generation potential at an L LSOA parish above building by building so, level? I don't think we can go down to LSOA because it will be disclosing some data that we're not allowed to sort of um, give out. But parish, yes, uh, for sure. Um, It'll probably be on the street. Well, yeah, soon within the next sort of week or two, we'll have that up. Um, yeah. And I think we've answered the question that we put the link in the chat, but we will be sending things as well. Um, and then Steve's talking about solely together scheme was available to commercial properties, but was not properly communicated to businesses. I feel this is a lost opportunity and should be better advertised. So um, let's just comment about the solar together. Um, um, Martin, Mark Sullivan. Um, um, I, don't, I think we've talked about that, but it's not really, the economics are not really included in the study. Um, did you want to say something, Mark? Yeah, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, sorry, I was it's a picture of all of it. Busy. Yes, so Mark Sullivan Warwickshire. Sorry, I couldn't get in at the beginning because I have found the link and everything now. Sorry, it was a bit of a problem because Eventbrite didn't give the link itself. Um but uh, no, on, on this question of um, the economics is is the point about the um, the rooftops. Uh, I mean, there was a comment at the top by Martin Heath, which I don't think is right, about whether large-scale ground mounts are cheaper than large commercial tops by 10 to 30%. I think it's more like 50%. Uh, and then there's a second point, which is rather more significant, which hasn't been mentioned, obviously is relevant when you start pursuing the warehouse and industrial rooftops, is which of them can actually accept panels it's generally stated that the very modern ones are too lightweight structures to do so, whereas older ones, 1970 or before, are strong enough. Uh, and nobody seems to really know whether building regulations, uh, building regs, um, people in local authorities actually are consulted about whether these large warehouses can take panels or not. In practice, um, unfortunately, CPOE Northamptonshire, Mr. Skittrell isn't here today, but he knows about this, that the agents for these large um, warehouse developers don't really want to do it. 
because then nobody wants to do it. And that's why we still got very few on on rooftop on warehouses. I, I don't know position in Southampton or Sussex, but this is a very serious problem in the um, Midlands where most of the warehousing is. So I don't actually think this problem has been tackled really by CPRE properly yet. Okay. Uh, but I'm okay. glad to see all the information and it's very useful to have these, this, 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 this whole research done by Southampton University. Very good. Thank good. You. Thank you, Mark. Um, um, Jerry has talked about the SAR data can go up to one metre resolution. So I think that's something to pick up, Luke and Ellis, just having a look at the options for the SAR data. Um, and Steve's then suggesting that we contact the councils, use the social media to share with public um, in, about engaging um, people with, with this. So um, I think we will do look, look more about how we can put this information out there. And we certainly got contacts with all the community energy groups across the uh, Hampshire and, and um, we'll be looking to work with Community Energy South and make sure this tool is available as widely as possible. Um, Marina is talking about engaging residents. Marina, do you want to come in on that one? Hello, about... hi. 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 Um, I think it's really helpful and it, it, it's it's obviously very exciting um, if you kind of look at it big picture. Um, but it's just how you actually get to the speeding up with with residents um and i'm I, just as, a, as an example um i thought it would be relatively straightforward G getting lots of quotes all all different things coming back and how on earth do you know where to start it's it's and then you find you you're you're researching it yourself and you think well actually i, I sort of need a phd here to actually get it because there's so much involved and it's a huge um investment um, yes. And and you know so an idea of kind of um, bigger scale, uh, it's sort of reaching residents in a bigger scale is great, but you've also got to realise that they need to trust it, so they don't yeah. want sort of a cheap fix or, you know, it's got to last, it's got to be really good quality, it's got to do everything on the tin, you know, for people to go there, but people want to, I think. Absolutely, which is why it was so good to hear about. There was it Steve that was talking about Solar Together earlier, and um, is, is there a Solar Together project in your area? Is is that something an option you could look at? Uh, uh, there is Solar Together, but it, it, when we got the brochure, it doesn't say an awful lot of. You know, I, I feel I've done almost more research than they've they've actually given us. It's sort of saying you know you can be part of this, but it. I sort of need much more information. I need much more engagement. I don't think I'm alone. I, you know, I hope I'm not alone. <laughs> but I'm, sure, I'm you know, sure you're not. No, you actually want point. really know. And also your roof capacity. It's all. It's a lot of us don't have this wonderful solar roof, big solar, you know, south facing. Um, so is it is it viable? or not and you get different companies saying well yes you can put it on this area you know but it's reality as well not really so yes you you left not doing anything yeah no i think that's a good point well made that there's lo still lots of work to do isn't there from from where it might be possible to actually make it happen on the ground there's a Wanting big comment <laughs> yes a big not comment negative. from mark <laughs> and, and mark do you want to come in about um we're talking about ground mounted solar. Mark Sullivan. It's chat. So I mean it's the same oh, really. Same. Uh, yeah. It's unclear. Uh, but, but somebody said earlier that the, the UCL study had come to something about 60% could be on rooftops. I don't think that's right. It sort of invented CPRE invented this distinction 60-40 at some point. And it doesn't really have any basis at all. Uh, the pr basic point about this, and it's obviously for all CPRE members listening, is if you, if you allow them on farmland, they're never going to go on industrial roofs anyway because the cheaper location is farmland. It's only if you have a planning policy that stops them going on farmland will the developers go on rooftop roof, the, the, put their arrays on where warehouse and industrial roofs. 
So uh, and unfortunately, that point was not resolved. Um, and I don't think it, but, but what is going to say is useful here is to see how many rooftops there actually are uh, on the industrial uh, and commercial uh, buildings, because that that was after all, you know, where we all came in, really. <laughs> Ten years ago, yes. there was a government policy to have a social yeah. strategy under the coalition government, but it, it sort of got lost. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, as I say, I think this is all excellent, but I don't see um, quite how it's going to solve the present problem we've all got. Thank you. Um, I just want to invite, is it um, David Edwards, who's uh, lead authority for Solar Together? Is David, do you want to just say something about your new scheme that's launched in 2025? Hi there. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to mention in the chat because so Solar Together had, had had a little bit of, um, there'd been a bit of traffic in the chat about it. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm part of the, the energy services team at West Sussex County Council. So over the last, well, since 2020, actually, we, we've um, coordinated the Solar Together Sussex scheme on behalf of all local authorities in Sussex. So there'll be other people on the call, I think, that have been involved in it. Um, and um, the whole premise is it's a group purchasing scheme. We work with an organization called iChooser. Um, so we kind of generate uh, interest in solar installs um, around Sussex and um, iChooser contract with um, trusted providers, um, MCS accredited providers to to install those those systems. So we've uh, since 2020, we've done about two and a half thousand installations. Um, in Sussex, um, and we'd say that's three rounds of the scheme we've run. Um, we, we're going out to procurement to do something similar, hopefully next year, if all the other local authorities um, agree they want to they want to support it. Um, so it's just really sort of yeah, mentioning that we have this scheme running, but obviously I, I, my interest in um, in this call today is very much around um, you know, how we um, increasingly take a sort of a you know, data led approach to the way we we market and promote the scheme. Um, so, so yeah, we are very much uh, one um, option in the marketplace. Um, but you know, we always encourage people to um, you know, sort of get other quotes themselves and and satisfy themselves that that the uh, the offer that we have um, is competitive, is good quality, and all that stuff. Really, yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, brilliant. Um, I think that's the main points. Is there anybody else that is keen to? Uh, Katrina has talked about um, Energised South Down. Katrina, do you want to just um, highlight some of the work that you're doing as well? You want the call still? Yep, yep. Um, hi there, thank you. Uh, yeah, so we're a community energy group. We're uh, based in Petersfield in Hampshire, and we're really trying to work with organisations um, who want to be more ambitious about solar but maybe can't afford the capital. Um, so yeah, we'd be really um, willing to work with an anyone that's keen to get some rooftop solar projects off the ground. Brilliant, thank you. Fantastic. So I think um, there's one new message. Um, from, from Steve Saunders. Um, Steve, do you want to talk about what you're doing in Lewis? <sighs> Well, what I was doing in Lewis, I was a Lewis District Councillor, but uh, part of the planning uh, requirements there were, as I've just explained there on the chat, was all new properties have to have EV charging points. Uh, it's frustrating. I still sit on the uh, New Haven Town Council Planning Committee where we don't have uh, developers, including things like PV panels uh, and, and other such uh, renewable energy schemes to the properties. There doesn't seem to be any any real requirement, and I think that should be more more focused uh, and part of the planning conditions that uh, these the District Council and the Planning Authorities uh, um, put down. Uh, yeah, I just think there, there's a, a tendency to sort of um, uh, play uh, with the uh, renewable energy requirements for new new properties. Um, and whereas building regulations obviously um, cover things like insulation uh, and, and other uh, uh, building techniques, but uh, I think we really should be having more insistence that these new new properties have polar uh, uh, PV uh, uh, panels on roofs, etc. There's there's lots. I mean, I'm a builder by trade, and there's lots of uh, of opportunities now with uh, with roofing materials to have. PV panels built into the uh, into the uh, tiles or slates that go on the roofs, um, so it's 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 not too difficult to do. And I just think we should be having more focus 
within the councils to, to try and uh, make sure that they, they're they there. I mean, the skis that we're talking about, the ones that I was uh, lucky enough to uh, to get involved in, as we've spoken about, the Solar Together scheme is, is great for existing roofs, but I think it should be far more uh, insistence that new roofs have them built in as a requirement of the planning conditions. Thank you, Steve, that's really helpful. I think that's most of the questions now. I'm going to hand back to Paul just to um, wrap up and to thank you all for coming. Um, really, really nice to see so many people. So thank you for your contributions. Yeah, thank a big thanks. A big thanks to Alison for uh, shepherding us through the last uh, hour and a half. Um, and both Alison and I and colleagues at CPRE's Hampshire and Sussex are very much available to uh, to kind of continue the conversation, to discuss what it means um, in your neck of the woods, to see if there's opportunities for further collaboration and making use of this um, making use of this information, and uh, so that we can get uh, as many panels on rooftops as uh, as possible. Um, and indeed, we'll definitely be uh, looking forward to uh, uh, putting our contributions in as, as local plans get reviewed and renewed um, uh, and trying to make sure that uh, some of those kind of policies that we were just hearing about um, make it into uh, make it into uh, local local plans. So um, we will be circulating uh, the slides and the um, information about where to find the map and the policy brief after the call. Massive thanks to everyone for coming. I hope you thought it was interesting. Um, I've certainly been inspired by uh, your questions and comments and um, very much looking forward to working with you over the coming weeks and months. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye.